Hello everyone, buongiorno. Um, sorry, but after Mario, that is about it. I can't say any more, so it's got to switch to English. Um, I'm mainly going to talk about the survey that we did with um, the International Federation of Sports Physical Therapy that some of you may well have participated in. But before I go any further, I need to explain something. Um, I'm based in Cardiff, as Karim said. Many of you may well not know where Cardiff was until maybe two weeks ago when they hosted the UEFA Champions League. Um, Cardiff is in Wales. We play rugby. We don't have, didn't have that good a football team until last year when they made the Europeans for the first time in something like 50 years. So football is very much a secondary sport, but we do have Gareth Bale. And so you will see a lot of pictures of Gareth Bale, just to warn you. So coming back to the serious business, um, the background, we know that the biggest risk of injury is previous injury. Um, many papers will support that in a variety of injuries and in a variety of sports. There's a huge variety of opinion um, amongst medical practitioners and, and that really is what our survey results supported as well. Um, but that is also a known fact and we'll see some of those things in a few minutes. Um, there's also little information about how physios make the decisions about return to play. Um, we use a lot of our clinical reasoning, we use what evidence is available, but there is precious little of that. Um, and anecdotally, there's a very wide range of practice amongst physios and I think our survey showed that. And we based our survey data collection on the Schreier model. I'm not going to go into it in a huge amount of detail because I know it will be referred to a number of times over the couple of days. But it serves as a really good model um, in which to, to construct your thinking. And that's why we use that as a model to start asking the questions that we did in the survey. Um, and to just take those step by step, basically what the model talks about is the athlete and the athlete as a whole, but also the tissue that's been injured, um, the health of that tissue, the capacity of that tissue to take load, and also the capacity of the person to tolerate the increased exposure to risk as they go back to sport. Then there's the activity that they go back to, so the sorts of risks that might happen in that activity, the type of load that happens, um, maybe the ability to protect the injury in some sports compared to other sports. The observant amongst you will see that that isn't Gareth Bale, but that is one of his Real Madrid colleagues, so sorry about the Juventus fans um, that maybe might not like to see a picture of him on there. The last part is risk tolerance, and this is where we set our threshold to where we think a risk is acceptable before they go back to sport. And that's where we talk about context. And it was very interesting to hear Mario include Paul Dijkstra's paper um, where he related to the coach being the one that provided the contextual knowledge. I would say that as physiotherapists working in this environment, contextual knowledge is extremely important for us as well because um, things change in different sports. We don't have a recipe that we pull off the shelf to make a return to play decision. So we have to put our decisions into context. Here we go, oh, we've gone a little bit fast. Here's an example of context and why it's important. So we took our two sports, Gareth Bale, you'll see there, um, and rugby. If we look at the incidence of ACL injury in rugby, between 56 and 86%, depending on what papers you look at, um, say that the ACL, more ACL injuries happen um, in contact, not non-contact. The most predominant one is when the, tackler is ball um, the player is ball carrying and they've been tackled. I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Also, 25% of those contact injuries happen in the ruck, which is unique to, sport, to rugby as a sport. So if we don't know the context of the sport that we're going back to, we can't do an effective return to play decision to help the coach make that decision with the athlete. If we look at football, as we call it, soccer, 
um, 64 percent of those injuries are in non-contact so a very different mechanism of injury that predominates in those sports so we need to know the sport before we send them back one point i just want to make from this and the slide is just to remind me to say it is that this return to play decision or return to performance decision isn't just one point at the end of a rehab program it's a continuum and throughout that what we're doing at each phase is to improve that tissue capacity to take the load that they're going to need when they go back to sport and also managing the tissue load until that tissue is viable enough to do that um, and, and it's important to know that we are making those decisions as we progress as well as right at the end we've heard about this the consensus paper so far and um, linking this back to Christian's comments this morning about we make a consensus statement when there's not enough evidence and I think that is partly the fact here but just again to put these into context if we look at return to participation that is going back to activity um, that is similar a sport specific part of rehab but it's not really the sport yet then they might go back to sport but it might be a lower level of sport it might be a lower competitive level or an easier sport or they might go back to their same sport but be protected so you can see there with the Welsh team of training some of them have got a different color bib on and that's to identify that they are back in non-contact training but they're not yet ready to take full contact and that's one of those things of, of how they start integrating players back into a, a team more easily which I'm sure Claire will cover a little bit later with the psychological factors with that and then we talk about return to full performance with all the risks that those entail. So my bit about the context um, and when we th think about practitioner development, we talk about contextual intelligence. And to be an expert, when you look at the characteristics that um, you read about an expert's behavior, they talk about things like the ability to change solutions depending on the circumstances that you're in. The ability to process complex patterns awareness of your scope and that practical know-how of what to do and how to behave in a certain environment so part of my role is, is to try and help develop practitioners so that they can do that so that they can transfer their medical knowledge and skills into the specific sporting context to actually work in that environment um, and, and that isn't easy so that leads us to what we wanted to find out in this IFSPT survey, which was how do these practitioners make decisions? Um, so we got our ethical approval through Cardiff University, we did an online survey, and we distributed it through social media. Um, we collected lots of demographics, which gave us some nice insights into the profession, actually. Um, we looked across country of practice, what sort of level of education, what academic level they had, what sporting background they had. We wanted to know whether practitioners made direct decisions about return to play or whether they were indirect, uh, whether they did that in a sporting environment or in a clinic. And we asked them to rank their preferences based on that Schreier model that you saw earlier. Um, and then we took a mode, so the most number of respondents for a ranking, and we also looked at percentage agreement because that was very enlightening. So just a bit of an idea of where we got our answers from. So we had 305 respondents, which wasn't huge given the number of membership we have in IFSPT, but it was enough to do something with. Um, and that was over 31 countries. And the size of those circles gives you an idea of where the most respondents came from. So a little bit of an idea um, of where they currently practiced, and that gives us a proportion of the respondents that we had. And you can see we had a large number back from the USA. Um, Australia, again, was a, a decent number, and New Zealand. Italy is in that red wedge where it was said we had less than 2% of the respondents in. But what I can tell you from that response of the ones that we had was that the predominant working sporting environment here is soccer and volleyball. That probably shouldn't come as a surprise to you, um, but that would seem to be um, the bigger sports here. We also had an idea of their years of experience, and you can see there was an average of just under 14 years qualified of these people that answered the survey. 
Um, but some of them were qualified more than 40 years. That's even longer than I've been practicing, I would say. There was an even spread of the level of competition that these physios worked in, bearing in mind they could all answer um, more than one. Um, so that's why it looks like there's more than 100% there for the observant. Um, but it does look like a half or more than half of people work in um, a variety of levels of sport. So we then asked them, um, do you make direct decisions on return to play? Uh, if we looked at the states, we can see that almost, it was 99% of the respondents um, were clinic-based. They made clinic-based decisions. But less than half of them made decisions actually in the, in the field with the team. If we then come to the UK, Again, almost 99% of the respondents worked in clinics, but they also worked and they make, made decisions in the field with teams. Um, so more than 90% again of those did. And that just reflects the type of practice of a sports physical therapist in that country. Then when we go to Europe, you can see a similar number worked in clinics um, and just slightly less people worked and made those decisions for return to play actually within, embedded within the teams. Then when we go to Australia and New Zealand, you can see that the, the balance between clinic-based and field-based was similar, but again, it was probably about two-thirds that actually worked both in clinic and in sport. So you can start to see there's another type of context here. It's about the context of our work in practice, in the environment and in the country that we work. Um, it's not just about the sport that you work in, it's what you're allowed to do or what is easy to, to manage in the country that you're based. Um, so let's have a look at some of the results. So if we think of that step one, we asked them about what things did they rank as the most important thing um, that influenced their decision based on the athlete that they see in front of you. So I'll just bring those up. And I would say there's probably not much of a surprise there. Um, we took rugby union and American football to allow us to look at two different types of working practices in those different contexts in different countries. So we could put UK, Australia and New Zealand together because rugby is, is quite a, a strong sport in those countries. And then American football um, in the US, which allowed us to filter across for uh, countries as well as sports because there, there were only one or two respondents in the US that actually worked in rugby and we just took those out to allow us to compare. But you can see they, they thought sport specific function was the most important. Um, it looks like the UK and Australia were less worried about pain than the Americans. Um, and then the rest were very similar across the way. What was different was about our levels of agreement. And there was really poor levels of agreement across both of these countries. We did have a 50% level of agreement about sport-specific function in UK, Australia and New Zealand. Everything else is below 40%, many of them just 20% agreement across that. So we have very varied thinking about what's important. Um, if we then go to the type of sport, um, sorry, I've, come, I've dashed on ahead. If we then think of the symptoms, what we find at physical exam in the clinic, what tests we might do, so the hop tests that Mario talked about on the runs, um, what was their history and so on, you can see again it was quite similar across sports, other than maybe the potential seriousness of the, the sport, where um, it looks like the UK, Australia and New Zealand ranked that very high, um, but the, the US didn't. But otherwise we were quite similar across countries but again, a huge variation within the profession about what we think is important. Again, if we go to the second part of that model, step two, where it was the type of sport, the ability to protect, so all those risks that we're trying to assess about going back to sport. And you can see, again, it was quite similar other than the competitive level. And again, if you think of that in the US, because of the sport that we looked at, it was American football, it tends to be they either play collegiate and make the draft of the NFL um, or they stop playing American football and play something else recreationally instead. So 
I assume that the competitive level was less important to them because of that. But again, um, really quite poor. Less than half of us agreed on anything, uh, which is a little worrying. And the same goes for where we set the threshold for the risk. Quite similar in the, the order across the sports and across the countries, but again, really, other than the far ends, so the first and the last ranked, everything else nobody really agreed with. And I think that fits with, you know, you can talk to one physio and they'll say something, you talk to another and they'll say something completely different. It's sort of saying where we are as a profession sometimes. Um, one of, with Claire's paper, um, so we're back to our consensus. What we know so far um, about this decision making about going back to sport, we've got the biopsychosocial model really, where we've got the physical aspects, the psychological aspects, and the social aspects. And I don't think any of those would come as too much of a surprise. I would say that the psychological again is really important, and that readiness for return to play, the fact that they're motivated to do that, um, and that they have this high self-efficacy seems to make a big difference about whether they get re-injured or not. And you can see there where we've got about that integration with the team is also important, which links back to what we talked about, that return to sport, but protected sport. This is just to flag up some of the things that came out of that consensus paper, and it really is only to say, we do this all the time, when it boils down to it, this is the amount of evidence, proper evidence we have to support our decision. And I would say that's not a lot. So we have to use our reasoning based on other principles to really make those safe decisions. And, and, and that's not easy either. Gareth Bale again. We've talked again about how much low do we do that. Uh, Karim talked about that to set the scene for the whole conference today. How fit should they be to return to play or to return to performance? This is an American football example, but it serves a good purpose to show. It's a shoulder, um, and they looked at general American footballers and linebackers in particular because they're more at risk. And so although we don't have that much um, in the UK, it, it does show a good example of what collision sport risks are. Now, these people get back to sport quite well. But when you have a look at this, now if I can find this without pushing the slide on, yes, here we go. So we've got general NFL there, and then we've got linebackers there. This graph talks about the matches they played for the rest of their career, and the graph on the right is the number of years that remained in for the rest of their career. And so you can see that although they got back to sport quite successfully after shoulder reconstructions, um, that return and continued performance actually was less positive, because in every case, they played less for the rest of their career, and they actually had shorter careers. So again, we're maybe not always doing these players a justice when we get them back quickly. Some other things to support that, Gareth Bale again. 80% um, more risk of having a second sprain after an initial ankle sprain. Hamstring recurrence between 18 and 63%, depending on what papers you read. Only 36% of soccer players still playing seven years post ACLR, so they have shorter careers again, potentially than uh, non-injured people. We need to bear that in mind. We've seen this as well, Karim showed this earlier today, um, and it is just to reinforce that, if you're only rehabbing these people at 40%, they're 28 times more likely to get injured when they go back. If you take them and push them much harder, even up to 90%, they're only three times or four times more likely to get injured. So we need to think about how hard we push these people, um, and we're not doing them a service if we protect them too much in those later stages of rehab. We have to prepare them for what they go back to. I'm going to talk about this because it's a bit of my soapbox, but it's those agility versus reactive agility. And again, we've heard this mentioned a few times, and it was included in the consensus paper. Um, it's not just your ability to perform an agility drill that's prepared. It's your ability to do that under a time constraint and be consistent and automatic. Do it quickly, make the correct decision, and also be able to adjust your movement as you do that. And we have to find ways to measure that to make them safe to go back. Then, just coming up to that, this last bit about, well, who should make these decisions? 
Um, so we, if we look at this and we think, who can modify the ex exercises and drills for the injury, the sport and the position they play? Who's able to analyse the demands of the sport? Who should lead? And we'll all probably go, yeah, we can do that. Um, we've already heard again from Mario, it should be a team decision. Those are the best ways that we can collaborate for the good of the player. And we need to agree on um, how much of this information is made available, particularly if it's a high profile event. Who should we make that information available to and how does that information get circulated? Needs to be a team approach, as we've said, and those would be the people that would be in the team. This paper surveyed all these practitioners um, in Canada and every one of those practitioner groups thought that they were the best people to lead and make the decisions. So we're not alone in thinking that we are the best people to do that. And there was quite a variation within and between stakeholder groups about how you should do it, bearing in mind that is country specific. So in conclusion, we just need to think about um, a return to sport assessment. We need to minimize this risk of re-injury. We know it's a problem. There are a wide variety of approaches and I, in, the, in certain circumstances, I don't think that's wrong. I think it's good to be able to vary our approaches so that we can be appropriate for the context of the sport that, that we're working in. Um, there's, but there is a general consensus that the physical and psychological readiness is important. It should be specific to the sport. You've seen the contextual issues and it should include quality as well as quantity of execution and, and where appropriate include reactive elements. I can't finish without acknowledging my co-authors, Mario and Phil are here, and Matt Townsend helped a lot with the statistics, um, and the return to play consensus group in Bern that helped us pull a lot of that together. Um, the Cardiff University supported the, the research and um, funded the survey, um, our IFSPT members for conducting the survey, and the Swiss group um, for helping host this when we had the meeting. Um, and that picture was my view from the Castel Sant'Angelo a few days ago. Um, I have really enjoyed Rome as a city. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>